This week, we welcome Peter Smith, the founder and CEO of Edgewise, to talk about Edgewise's one-click micro-segmentation. And we're going to find out, will it defend? And maybe will it blend? In the second segment, we welcome back Corey Thun from, uh, he's the founder and CEO of Gravwell, to talk about security analytics using the new Sysmon DNS logging that dropped this week. In the security news, the rise of purple teaming the world's largest beer brewery sets up cyber, a cybersecurity team. A mystery signal shutting down key fobs in an Ohio neighborhood. Why hackers ignore most security flaws and warnings of real world worldwide worm attack. That is way too many W's in one sentence. <laughs> warnings of worldwide are worm attacks about? are the real deal. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with their proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email at contact at netsparker.com. Is your IT team ready to face the next implementation or upgrade? Do you have a pool of talented team members who are trained and ready to support your organization? growth, the right IT skills development platform can get you past the IT skills gap. With training content that's so engaging, some even call it binge-worthy learning, your team will watch and learn more with IT Pro TV. Get a free team trial of IT Pro TV today. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IT Pro TV. Thinkst Canary makes high fidelity honeypots that set up in minutes and requires no ongoing administration. Attackers moving silently on your network advertise their presence by tripping over them. There's a good reason Thinkst Canaries are deployed and loved by some of the best security teams in the world. They're inexpensive, they're simple, and they work. For more information, go to securityweekly.com forward slash canary or direct message at sign Thinkst Canary on Twitter and welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce you to a man who cleaned the smeg out of the ice bucket, Paul Sidorian. Welcome, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. This is episode 608, recorded on June 13th, 2019, right here at G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, where Mr. Larry Pesce is sitting to my left. Larry, Hooray! welcome. Yay. 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 <laughs> I will uh, also introduce Peter Smith uh, from Edgewise, who's here with us. Peter, welcome. Thanks for having me. Yes, nice to <coughs> have you. got the lab coat in. Oh, the lab coat's essential. When you said you were doing a lab, <coughs> lab coat, I was like, that's cool. But now you've got like a special logo on it that special goes along logo. with your product announcement. Uh, exactly. You're having way too much fun, dude. I, I, I'm trying to. you gotta <laughs> got to make cybersecurity no fun. That's awesome. On the lines remotely, Jeff Mann is with us from the the man cave or the man shack or the love shack, however you want to say it. What do you call it, Jeff? I call it the cabin. The cabin. The cabin. Yep. That's very Some, Sometimes creative. the man cave. Sometimes the man cave. Yeah. It is more like a cabin and less like a cave, I guess. It is. Yes. If, if it was underground, then it would be a cave. A man who hears all of the problems about my python code mr joff thyer is here with us joff welcome <laughs> hello paul it's good to be here and you know i'm glad i could help with your python you're like you my python <laughs> you're like my python counselor like it's still up to me to fix all my own problems which is mm. totally cool because they are in fact my problems but uh, Joff's like my shoulder to cry on. So, <laughs> so it might might be fair to say that every once in a while, you and Jeff get together and he massages your Python. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe <laughs> code code. Right, right. Python code. code. Yeah, yes, that's what yes. I meant. Right. Yes, yes. And by as my, my, yeah, as long as it's Jeff doing the massaging, I'm doing the fixing. It's, it's you know, <laughs> some weeks I think like, wow, programming's awesome. Like, we don't need to hire a whole bunch of developers. Like, I got this. And then there's some weeks where. I'm calling Joff to, to cry on his shoulder, and I'm like, wow, we really need to hire some developers because I'm really frustrated. <laughs> it was one of those weeks this week that was frustrating. So I feel like there's fits and starts when you're, you know, a developer, as always. And uh, this was a very trying week. So 
Hopefully it ends on a good note tomorrow and I get some more. So you learned working. a lot? I learned a lot. That's what I try and stay positive on. Lee Neely is here with us with the, the glass Greetings. half full, right? I learned a Absolutely. lot about how the code works, about how SQL al alchemy works, and all kinds of fun stuff. So it's, all, it's always a learning experience. Uh, let's see, quick announcement before we get started. Register for our upcoming webcast with SaltStack Logarithm. ISC Squared and Domain Tools, all fantastic webcasts. The first half is basically like a mini entertainment training session. In the last webcast, I talked about mapping MITRE attack framework items to the security issues that I felt the Empire had in Star Wars Rogue One. It was fun. People, people liked it. Uh, I liked it. I tend to uh, be, now the problem is I'm like I'm getting like requests, and people want me to do it again, <laughs> and I'm like this. It's not like a, that kind of a thing. Like I just happened to be watching that movie with my youngest son because he's a huge Star Wars fan, and uh, yeah, and the thought came to me. I don't know if I could. Re I guess I could, but we'll see. We'll see. The next one could be uh, also Pulp Fiction. Someone said. For movie suggestions, go Hopefully, to securityweekly.com. Hopefully you're not watching that. Slash movies. <laughs> no, I'm not watching that with my kids. It was a <laughs> suggestion. Uh, but to uh, register for our upcoming webcast, go to securityweekly.com forward slash webcast. If you missed one, like the Rogue One to uh, attack framework uh, correlation, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. Peter Smith is here with us, of course. Are you founder or co co-founder? Co-founder. Co-founder. Yep. I thought so. <laughs> Harry Spurdlove so. is my co-founder. Harry yep. is yes, the other founder. Yes, who has also been here he on has. the show with Lemoncello. Right. <laughs> did he bring it? He did. Oh, his wife's uh, delicious. Absolutely amazing. Delicious. Uh, it is quite the process uh, to make, and it sounds like you've been going through quite the process. Uh, well, more likely your developers. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's true. That's true. Yes. Uh, and you've come up with this one-click micro-segmentation that we've talked about. Now, what I'm excited, I cover this on Enterprise Security Weekly. I was basically like, look, there's a lot of configuration points and control points in, let's say you're, let's just take a DevOps tool chain as an example. Yep. Since I've been doing developing, right? I know where most of the bodies are buried in terms of like, this is where I define how it connects to that database and here's where I define that that container can talk to that container and here's where I define that the database that's in Amazon's cloud accepts connections from these IP addresses, right? So I, I know all that stuff. To put that all together and be like, oh yeah, I could just whip up a script and, and do micro-segmentation is going to be awesome. Yeah. No, I'm like, yeah, no. the way I phrase this, <laughs> we really need help of other software to do that mapping for us, uh, give us kind of the lay of the land, and then let us make a decision, right? That's exactly it. Yeah, there's just way too much complexity mm -hmm. in how all these services interact for any individual to really wrap their heads around it. And uh, really, it just comes down to machines can do it more efficiently and yep. more effectively than people can. Absolutely. I, and I, I really think it's the future. What I uh, kind of went on a limb and said uh, on Enterprise Security Weekly was, Basically, the tasks of network administration, systems administration, uh, of course, development, both with respect to your infrastructure and security, are really all going to be accomplished in code, essentially, and in software to Could, today. Couldn't agree right? more. Couldn't agree more. And I think, uh, you know, you go into a greenfield environment, you're first time using AWS, you're going to spin up a couple services, you can go and methodically define every single interaction. Yes. But... When you're a enterprise with 20 years of legacy, you are you are not going to wrap your head around that. No. 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 And so you need to just take a risk-based uh, approach so that you can make reasonable decisions, model out policies, and make sure that they, uh, you know, provably don't have unnecessary exposure. And once you're satisfied, you put it into a simulated block mode and... That means that you're actually enforcing. It's just that any block doesn't actually take a service down. Once you uh, uh, are satisfied that it's everything is running smoothly, mm -hmm. put it into enforce and you're off, off to the races. Yeah, and what I like too is it, uh, I like it to highlight those areas that you can easily identify, right? Because like we said, there's all this configuration all over the place. And I just want to be able to look at the... I always think of Mike Poor in his story when he's looking at this big architecture. It was like printed out on a plotter. Right, and he's reviewing, you know, walking around in very dramatic, as only I can imagine it, 
I imagine it this way, in very dramatic Mike Poor fashion. He's walking around this gigantic plotter printout of a, <laughs> the network uh, diagram and architecture, right? And he's just kind of stroking his beard. And, mm, it's, it's interesting. It's, it looks pretty good. He's like, but what is that right there, right? Yeah. And it points to the weakest exposure point <laughs> yeah. in the entire <laughs> diagram, right? And, and that's how I kind of see this technology, right? And I think of our own security incidents that we've had with, with our DevOps system, that if I had that big plotter diagram, I go, hmm, I'd be dramatic just like Mike Poor and try and emulate him. <laughs> and I go, what is that? Like, why is the internet able to connect to our Docker API? Like, that's bad. It, exactly. Right? Yeah. Big SaaS provider, we were in there, and they were like, hey, how come, how come I see this connection coming from the UK data center that's not supposed to be allowed? And every time somebody looks at one of these maps, it's just like Mike looking at that yeah. plotter. He's like, yeah. what the heck is that? Right. And it's it's uh, it, it's virtually guaranteed whenever somebody looks at it. You know what the funny thing is, though, that 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 diagram that that plotter printed out yeah. probably took 30 minutes to print. Right. By the time it finished printing, it was already out of date. <laughs> so <laughs> you need so to keep true. it updating. It's so true. <laughs> I, I like to think of it as um, there was a, a, another segment that I was doing that made me realize that we all keep security policies largely in our heads or at least there's oh, a yeah. percentage of them that's always like the policies in my head and organizations i think in as a whole and when this was pointed out to me i'm like no i, I think this is true do a very poor job of defining the security policies like uh -huh. we most of us on the you know all of us on the show most of us listening can look at a diagram like that that we're familiar with and go yeah that's the the bad thing that we need to fix right but where think about where that's documented right? usually it's like oh when we worked for the university like what should students you know be able to connect to and who should be able to connect to the students and largely we had to like try things and 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 put things out there and if no one got pissed off then you could do it, it right and that was our policy right like don't let anyone get pissed off that's a very poor policy by the <laughs> yeah, way yeah, when it yeah. comes to security that is the the worst policy <coughs> yeah, you turn wanna, it on and see who streams right you want to define it get get buy in then when you go to your you know air quotes firewall when you go to your security controls mm -hmm. you can then implement that that policy and that's there essentially what we're talking about it is that's exactly what we're talking about i think the big twist on it is uh we uh we look at identity as well Mm -hmm. So it's not just ports, protocols, addresses, so on and so forth. We, uh, we actually look at what's communicating and we say, you know what? Is it actually Paul talking to Peter? If it's mm -hmm. not, then it shouldn't be allowed. Only if it's Paul talking to Peter, then it's allowed. So we do this verification on both sides of the connection. Anyway. And so how do you verify that the application is really the application? Because that's oh, another yeah, layer. Yeah. That, no, yeah. That's, a, that's a good question. Uh, so uh, we actually uh, recently received three patents. We have uh, eight more pending, and one of them covers exactly this. Mm -hmm. um, and really what it, what it comes down to is you're looking at immutable properties of the software and mm -hmm. the device. So for instance, a device, you're looking at the UUID of the BIOS, the serial numbers of CPUs, things that can't be readily changed by an attacker. <coughs> uh, we source that data on Linux from LSM or mm -hmm. WFP modules on Windows so that we can get sort of kernel level data without being a heavy kernel module. Right. Um, and we for software, we look at things like fuzzy hashes, which are just really fascinating uh, data structures. Yeah, you take my, a fuzzy hash and compare it, you can see right. how similar things are. Yeah, because you don't have the hard, like in a container with that's running an application, you don't have a lot of those really good uh, non-immutable kind of <laughs> yep. things yep. to deal with. But I know if I, let's, a, a human looking at the code, I go, yeah, that's my application. Like yep. even if someone's gone through a few revisions of it, right? Yep. I can look at the code and look at the way it's gone. Like, yep, yeah, that's my application. And all you're doing is basically putting that in software, that Th intelligence that's in right. software. Yeah, yeah, that's right. When you upgrade your software, you push a new version of it. We take the fuzzy hash, we take the signing certificates, mm -hmm. we take all of these attributes, about 30 of them, and we compare them to the thing that was there before it. And we say, is it a high probability that this is actually the same software? And mm. it wasn't just somebody mucking around with the code, trying to inject something into it. And if it is, mm. then it automatically inherits the policies, no administrative change at all. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so now this new feature, you're calling it like the one-click microsegmentation, yeah, right? Segmentation, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, tell us a little more about, about that feature and how it, it's implemented sure. and used. Yeah, so um, <coughs> microsegmentation in general is viewed as just sort of uh, incredibly complex. And what we realized is that 
um, we go through a process to figure out what the appropriate microsegmentation policies are, and there's really no reason that a machine shouldn't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we iterate on the policy set, and we basically refactor the policies over and over and over again, just like you would do if you were bigging, building out a big microsegmentation program. And at the end of that, we present recommendations. This is a Bayesian analysis. It's not a neural network. Neural mm -hmm. networks can't sort of show you why they made decisions, but Bayesian analysis can. So mm -hmm. we do this Bayesian analysis on all of these identity properties that interact in your network, and we come up with this nice consolidated policy set, and we show you the recommendations. We say, we think these things should be able to communicate. Um, and then when you click the auto segment button, literally all it's doing is taking that set of recommendations we made for you and putting them into in enforce mode with a simulated block. So it exercises every code path. It does similarity analysis. It does everything we do. And then right at the moment, it's about to block something. It says, you know what? Uh, because it's in simulate block right now, mm. you did one click auto segmentation, I'm not actually going to block it. I'm going to let it go through, but I'll tell you that I was about to. Mm -hmm. And then when you're satisfied with how the ML generated policies are functioning, you uncheck simulate block and everything is into active enforcement with yes. real blocks. I think that that approach is, in my mind, the absolute a great way to do it, in yeah, my opinion. And it's provable too, right? Like, uh, think, about, think about finding threats, right? There's an infinite number of threats. We, I saw a stat the other day, it said uh, 230,000 malware samples are collected by vendors every single day. Vulnerabilities, I saw a stat that was 19 uh, vulnerabilities on average published every single day. It's infinite mm. problem space. It's growing every day. You cannot quantify how close to detecting everything you are because everything grows every single day. Right. Yeah. But networking is different. There's only, in IPv4, there's 4 billion to the 4 billionth minus 1 possible network connections in an IPv4 network. Mm. Well, it's bounded. It's a large number, but it's yeah. still bounded. And if you can measure it, then you can quantify how close to a perfect policy you are. So once we finish all this auto-segmentation, we actually spit out the metrics that say, these are the number of pathways that are used. These are the number that are, are needed. And you can eliminate all of these unneeded pathways that we discovered. I love the, the level of nerdiness, Peter. It, it's, I, it's, I it's know. so I, awesome. <laughs> Jeff, you have a question? Yeah, before we get too far, mm. um, could we start with a basic definition of what is micro-segmentation oh, yeah. and compare sure. in contrast to traditional segmentation? Yeah. Uh, start with that, and then maybe I have a couple more questions. No, no problem. So traditional segmentation is typically the perimeter model. You put a big bubble around a bunch of systems. It's typically a lot of systems. And you have unfettered access within the perimeter, but you can't come across the perimeter boundary. It's basically it's like Scarif block. in uh, Rogue One. That's the planet with the shield around it where the archives There you are. go. And yeah. then the, uh, the little window and opens. The window and the window that opens. Can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ex exactly. Exactly that. That is traditional segmentation. Um, now, uh, micro-segmentation would be to say, uh, take your applications that are working together. So you've got an ERP system. The ERP system is built up of a proxy server for inbound access from clients. It's built up of a couple, let's pretend like it's Java applications, mm -hmm. and it's built of uh, a few databases. I don't think Group we have to pretend most of them are Java. M m yeah. M <laughs> yeah, m most of them are, are exactly like that. Yeah. Uh, it draws a circle around those, and it controls what can come in the front door, and then it allows communications between those components. We take it a step further and we actually verify the communications both across the boundary as well as within the boundary and we do that based on identity mm. so when I, I i worked for a uh, a lottery company and we would design like theoretically if we had to put this in a, a lottery site let's say and they were all different and this was you know almost 20 years ago so uh, i can safely talk about it now right because i'm sure it's vastly <laughs> yeah, right. different but we would talk about you know there's a web server there's an app server and there's a database and what tools and then what rules and how would we enforce the web server and what it could communicate to the app server and what the app server could communicate to the database and then which segments outside of that if the database administrators or the developers needed access and we would manually map all that out on a whiteboard and try and come up with a design and then again it was different for every and it was physical hardware right there was a physical firewall mm -hmm. between the web server <laughs> and the app server right Today, all those decisions are made in software. Very much the same decisions that we're talking about today, Peter. I'm sure your customers are 
probably having the same you know conversations like basically we've got a handful of containers and they need to talk to each other in some in some fashion and we want to restrict it as much as possible right? that's right yeah and and that's hey, what this uh, uh please please yes josh oh i was i was gonna ask a quick 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 question um so uh, you know um i'm i'm one of these guys that's had like uh, I, I don't even remember how many years doing network engineering <laughs> um more than many. 20 yeah yeah a few just um, a little older than i am <laughs> yeah, but but definitely sexier. Um, <laughs> it's the accent <laughs> and quick witted. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> which uh, is not which is pretty good for a man of your age. <laughs> and I'm I'm gonna lose the question. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> up. Better write it um, down. Yeah. Challenge. Uh, here we go. Yeah, challenge. Um, the the white switch, the um the uh, blank switch market, software defined networking. How do you f how how does your solution play in that area where, where do you see the developments of the open uh uh software defined networking stack going and 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 how you guys going to play there in the future that's a great question um so software defined networking for um basically uh doing away with traditional routing topologies mm -hmm. get rid of ospf and all of that and you can dynamically route communications within a network fabric um <clears throat> that that's fantastic for uh, modifying the structure of your network. Um, but generally, it's not concerned with uh, the identity of what's communicating across it. And so um, people are still relying on firewalls, in most cases, even when they're using SDN. And what we're doing is slightly beyond that. So we don't really care how communications occur within the network. We don't but, care how routing happens. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. But the uh, promise of uh, software-defined network is going to go way, way beyond just reconfiguring topology. Th there will be uh, a time, in fact, it's already occurring, where the enforcement can be actually at the edge of the network and driven by the control plane, which is completely software. So uh, I think you do have a space to play there down the road, and I, I'm, I'm sort of I, crystal I, ball. I agree. I agree. We we do have a space to play there. Um, I, I would just say, recast it slightly and say that software-defined security as it pertains to networking and software-defined networkings, networking will inevitably converge. And today, I view them as separate spaces, but I agree completely with you that mm. at some point in the future, our technology combined with an SDN solution come together to make a unified platform that verifies sure. communications verifies routing topology, uh, dynamically routes, end-to-end -end meaning software to software. It's truly end-to-end, -end, from mm -hmm. the software that initiated the connection straight through to the software that receives the connection. So it, how, are you, how are you enforcing traffic flows now? You can make the decision, right? Uh, you, you must be able to play in the firewall space, but are you playing in anywhere of the switch route space as well? Not, not the switch route space yet. Um, we're certainly playing in a competitive space relative to firewalls uh, where we can make those control decisions based on the software. Um, and at some point in the future, I could certainly see being able to do uh, routing based decisions, especially when you're in a hybrid cloud environment where you want to change the routing topology as it pertains to on-prem mm -hmm. relative to your cloud environment. Uh, and yep. maybe even giving a little bit more flexibility to how routing works within a cloud environment through using our overlay. And that's really what we are. We're an overlay that exists right above the network. The network underneath it does what it does. It routes the way it routes. But we could certainly route through our overlay in a different way. And uh, you require an agent beyond the yeah, endpoints? Yeah, so we're an LSM module for Linux and a WFP module for Windows. And what that lets us do mm -hmm. is a, a couple really interesting so things. So it's, it's a light, it's more like a plug-in style. It's, it's a plug-in, it's, not it's a, a plug-in style yeah, agent. That's yeah, yeah. exactly right. Okay. Um, does, 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 that imply, does that imply that you're doing enforcement on the endpoints as well then? We are, yeah. So we actually okay. do it at the, uh, LSM gives us access to the system call layer. So when a piece okay. of software in user land talks to the operating system and says, hey, I want network resources, we actually, through LSM, intercept that request right at the system call layer. And what happens is the second we intercept the request, we, uh, through LSM, we're able to look up into user land and see this is the identity of the software. We collect mm -hmm. our properties, we collect them on both sides of the connection and verify them. We do that in 
the typical latencies are two to five microseconds. On the heaviest, most heavy, heavily loaded system we've seen, mm -hmm. uh, this was a customer environment, the max we saw was 10 microseconds of latency. So phenomenally mm, that's performant. Yeah. Nice. Typical, typical next-gen firewall, for instance, a control decision is around 125 microseconds. So an order of magnitude faster. That's really Very awesome. Very nice. Yeah. Okay, I'm done with my so, questions. Oh, no, hammer away. <laughs> 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 I've Jeff. got another one. Sure. So um, you have the ability to make these decisions uh, on whether a connection is authorized or not. Somewhere along the line, somebody, presumably the customer in the, in the company, um, uh, and I'm being very generous here. Uh, they know what they know what uh, should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed, at least at some level. I like what you had said earlier about you know you can give them sort of the metrics and and make recommendations. But you know who ultimately decides you know sort of the response strategy for what you're doing in terms of what gets allowed and what's what's not being allowed. Yeah, it, it really is a focus on risk-based decisions. So when you think about the traditional approach that a network administrator would take, um, they would be building a perimeter around a data center, let's say. Uh, mm. they, they had a highly segmented environment. Uh, finance was in its own layer two broadcast domain with its own addresses. They see an SSH connection coming from the finance network into some application. They make a risk-based decision that people in finance aren't SSHing into a system and they close that port down. Um, we don't quite follow that path, but we say this is what is normal interactions in your environment. These are what are consistent behaviors of your user. It's not a templating system. It's a yeah. Bayesian analysis. So it's looking at You may at look patterns. at that and be horrified and go, well, if that's the mm -hmm. way they're doing it, that's really messed up. Right. And there's a disagreement mm -hmm. and arguments yep. and it, at it, some exactly. time right, you come to a decision. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. This is, um, so there's actually two types of objects that we identify through ML. One is things that look and behave similar to each other. So that's a reinforcing property of uh, Paul does it, you do it, the other person does it, and they do it consistently. Um, you log into a database once a week, and then we see somebody that logs into a database that occurs every hour or does large bulk transfers. That's mm -hmm. an outlier event, right? That's something that is a, a deviation from the norm. Um, and we try to group these like communication patterns into buckets. Uh, we call those collections. Um, and then we try to group systems that are working together. You can see when you look at a, 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 a directed graph of communications, you can sort of see space around uh, certain regions of the network. Those regions are called subgraphs. And effectively what the Bayesian analysis does is it sees the subgraph, it sees space around it, and it says, oh, all of those objects within the subgraph they are actually working together, together to deliver yeah. a service. You clip the subgraph off and you say, take this and put it inside an object. So now you've got two different types of things, things that do similar stuff and things that are working together to deliver mm -hmm. a service. And the similar things are just like what you were talking about. Uh, when you were saying that you had layers, you had tiers, the proxy layer, you had the app layer and the database layer. Those are tiers of things that are doing similar things. Mm -hmm. And then the second analysis says, hey, look at these tiers. This tier is working with this tier is working with this tier to do something. Draw a circle around, around the whole that. thing. Yep. And now you've got all of your layers broken out and you've got the object that is the business service. It's awesome. Yeah. One of the, one of the coolest things uh, about the analysis we do, um, we were actually just in April awarded a patent on being able to see through load balancers, mm -hmm. layer seven proxies, as well as network address translation without modifying their configuration or uh, without um, installing an agent. We can literally see through these completely abstracting network devices to see end-to-end -end application communication, which is one of the biggest challenges in micro-segmentation. Uh, you look at F5. F5 sold billions of dollars worth of load balancers. Uh, they just bought Nginx. You've got Citrix uh, net scalers. These are billion dollar businesses, meaning everybody uses load balancers. And if a load balancer sits between a tier, you can't see what's on either side. And mm -hmm. that's one of the biggest hurdles to micro segmentation. You don't have this full end to end topology map. And uh, one of the coolest analysis we do is allowing us to see through this. And uh, if you're interested, I'll, I'll share just briefly sort of how we do it. Uh, we treat everything like a waveform. If you look at latency bandwidth, it makes a waveform on the inbound side. 
when it comes out the other side, it makes the exact same waveform. So if you can capture the waveform on both sides of this unmanaged, unknown mm -hmm. load balancer, you can actually determine that that is an end-to-end -end connection between software inbound to software, or, or software outbound to software inbound, and map the connectivity of the entire environment through all of these intermediary that's, devices. That's an amazing way to approach mm -hmm. that problem. That's Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so that's, uh, that's John O'Neill, uh, <coughs> Dr. Dr. John O'Neill, uh, who is our chief data scientist. That was his brainchild. That's awesome. Awesome. Th and now that you say it, like, that makes so much sense. Like, why didn't it's I think a, of that? It's a digital mm -hmm. signal processing problem. You can think of it as a, a fast Fourier transform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you compare two FFTs on both sides, and all of a sudden, oh, those FFTs match. Done. That could potentially have a lot of uh, different applications as well. Oh. So I'm, I'm wondering, Sorry, um, Lee. I, as, as I'm, as I'm, as I'm digesting this, I'm thinking, you know, you, you walk, we walk into a mature organization and I mean, this stuff is awesome and I can see it in the small and I'm thinking about how hard it was just to do web application firewalls. How do you, how do you eat the elephant without killing the company? I love it. Um, so, uh, uh there's nothing like a, like an example. Uh, so, um, we met, uh, this guy, Steve Strout. He's the global head of technical operations for Vonage. We met him at uh, reInvent last mm -hmm. year. Um, an on-site meeting, two phone calls later, we were protecting his environment. Uh, this is Vonage. Uh, he allows us to <coughs> speak publicly about it, so sure. <laughs> I'm not uh, disclosing anything sensitive. And um, really, to your point, this is a massive company, lots of legacy. They've got complexity out the wazoo. And you need somebody to come in and solve the problem instantly. Well, the way traditional micro-segmentation vendors have been handling this as a professional services engagement, mm -hmm. they'll take an army of people, put it on the problem, try to figure out how your environment works, build policies, and about a year later, they've solved the problem. Um, with this approach, it's really just about modeling your environment automatically, making these recommendations, reviewing them, saying, they look good enough for me, I filtered out all the known bad stuff and putting it into this simulated mode. Let it run for a while. Let it run for a couple weeks and see what it is actually blocking, what it is actually allowing, and then put it into enforce mode. And I kid you not, um, Steve Strout brought us in there. We auto-segmented. It was two two-hour phone calls, and we were done. This is, this is a year-long process for most organizations. Yeah, that's awesome. And at a large telco, it was two two-hour phone calls. That's crazy cool. I, 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 I'm just like going, wow. I'm thinking about other environments I know. I'm thinking that would just blow their minds to be able to get there that easily and quickly. So and it's really yeah. cool. It'd this be frustrating week, for those of us that have spent all that time trying to figure out how things work and communicate. And yeah. Listen, I, I, I know. Um, I, I had this uh, realization a couple months ago that. Like we, we've got this technology that can literally, not edgewise, but humanity has technology that can literally land rockets on a barge in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's SpaceX, right? 90% of the time. No, I, well, sure. Yeah, I, yeah, there was a, that's learning, a really good success There was a rate. learning curve. Yeah. But they're doing really well now. Uh, you've got autonomous vehicles that more or less can drive door to door. Um, Tesla's pretty close to realizing this vision. Mm -hmm. For how many decades we've had the ability to search 30 trillion pages instantly with really high accuracy. It's not a question of whether we know the appropriate math, whether we have the appropriate technology to accomplish these outcomes. It's a question of applying it to a problem space. Right. And up to this point, um, data scientists have not been applying their domain expertise to micro segmentation. So what I did was I went and hired a bunch of data scientists, mm -hmm. put them in a room and said, figure this out, led by John O'Neill. And this is what they came up with. And it's, it's spectacular. I, uh, last point is uh, uh, I was just at a, at a customer, um, a local customer. And the way we train people is we have them manually build the policies that we think ML will produce mm -hmm. more or less. And we want them to have an understanding of how ML does what it do does. So we sort of take them through that step-by-step -step process. And it's, it's a little bit drawn out. Um, and then at the end of it, we have them delete all of their policies. 
and then go and do one-click auto segmentation. And the reason we do this is because if we just threw up a bunch of policies and they saw them, they'd be like, okay, what does that mean? Yeah. But the yeah. fact that they built a set of policies that they had confidence in, and then they click auto segment, and I kid you not, it was the exact same policy this guy had just made. Pops on the screen. His response, I don't know uh, uh, if it's appropriate for yes, TV, it but it was, holy shit. It's, I mean, it, it's just, it, it's one of those moments where I'm just story. like, okay, yeah. I yeah. love this. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I like that too, because I'm a huge fan of when you have that uh, automation is to do, do it by hand first and then use the automation, yeah. right? Because then you, you understand how it's built. You can troubleshoot it better if it requires some type of troubleshooting or understanding, right? But I'm a huge fan of, like, even a lot of the automation that I do today in my development process, right? Like, I spent the time, I built the Docker containers by hand. I've done all the command line Git things. I've done the MySQL all from the command line with no completion, no nothing, right? Then when I get the automation tool, I'm like, wow, that's... Exactly what you said, Peter. That's exactly how I do it, except now it's just way faster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bought yourself some time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you've got a demo uh, in a, oh, yeah, sure. uh, uh, a campaign that you're calling Will It Defend? That's right. And because I'm, people are probably wondering why well, you have a lab coat on and a blender. That's right. Um, yeah, it, I do have a blender. <laughs> Larry and I are big fans of Will It Blend. Yes. And that was like a popular YouTube channel. Was it a YouTube channel? Yeah, Tom Larry? Dixon. Yep. Yeah. Back in the day when we first started yeah. the podcast, and there were only so many YouTube channels back then. I mean, obviously now. Oh, so many good. Yeah. It, it, there was like a handful that we would watch and kind of model and say, that's really cool. They've got a good idea, and we, we want to go down this path uh, like 14 years ago, right? Now there's like millions of YouTube channels all competing to do something crazy. But back in the day... All you had to do was take random stuff and put it in a blender, and you yeah, had like yeah. the most popular YouTube channel, right? The, the best one, that the golf club. He took a carbon fiber fiber golf club, and literally pulverized <laughs> it. It was dust wow. at the end. It was perfect. It's awesome. <laughs> so you came up with this concept called "Will it defend?" Well, I mean, it's uh, roughly based on "Will it blend?" Right? Sure. I think Tom Dixon uh, did just an amazing job with "Will it blend?" and uh, what I what I've come to appreciate in cybersecurity is that there's not there's not enough uh, uh, edutainment, mm. right? It, it's got to have a balance of education and yes. entertainment. And from from my own selfish reasons, um, I I think awareness is lacking in this whole zero trust model mm -hmm. and how it compares to traditional approaches with firewalls. And I really just want to bring that awareness to the foreground in a simple format, three minute videos that really just put to the test, will it defend? Will a firewall stop an exploit from compromising a vulnerability? And we'll go through one vulnerability a week. Uh, we're gonna start with, um, I think it's a CVE uh, 2012-56-34 uh, and the exploit is MySQL jackpot. Mm -hmm. um, and really, it'll start with uh, a light education, basically, um, and I'll sort of spoil it right now. Uh, that CVE, uh, there was a permissioning error in MySQLD uh, in the plugins directory. And you could take a user defined function SQL statement and send in any shared object, and it would just drop it into the plugins directory and load it as a plugin. Any, literally, any shared object. No. Drop it right in the plugins directory and load it. And so um, I saw this and I was like, oh, interesting. Will a next-gen firewall detect this? They've had plenty of time to figure mm -hmm. it out. It's from 2012. So I took an NGFW, I put it between my app server and my database server, and I ran the test. Nope, Silent. didn't detect it. But what wow. it did detect is, it's worth noting, um, the payload, the, the shared yeah. object that gets load, loaded, it's a, a reverse shell. Mm -hmm. And the NGFW detected the reverse shell. The, because signature, yeah, the, it, the it, signature. It sees yeah. that it saw a command prompt that mm -hmm. was clearly the uh, right. uh, 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 a, by, a reverse and shell. And by then it's too late. Well, you know what? Potentially too late. That is exactly it. That's the, that's the craziest thing I, I found was that um, so I was saying before that the, the latency of an NGFW to detect and stop a threat is around 125 microseconds. And if you script the initial interaction with the command line, the time window that it takes the NGFW to detect that it's actually a reverse shell, you can pop off one command. 
So the one command I pop off is to change the administrator's password. There you go. And mm -hmm. there we go. We're in. So anyway, yeah, or, we'll, uh, or realize that it's been blocked and then modify it, your attack so that it's not blocked by exactly. Firewall. So w or rm dash rf forward slash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Depending on your proclivities. So we uh, we do these tests. We're going to do uh, MySQL jackpot, then Petcha. We're going to do the recent Windows RDP exploit. And it's really just to say, the day these things were released, could your existing technology stop it? And then the punchline, of course, just like Will It Defend is, can Edgewise stop it? So we do this uh, mm. auto segmentation and, and see if it works. The next one will be, what's the this next, uh, the NTLM uh, message integrity check dropping? Yeah. Y that's exactly it. Yeah. And, so uh, what, w uh, WIA, the Windows Integrated Authentication for the website? Yeah, stuff so as well. we, uh, we've got a, a friend who built a, um, a it's not really malicious software, but it's it's for a pen testing solution mm -hmm. that can compromise this vulnerability. So we'll get these vulnerabilities from wherever, and if people want to actually submit vulnerabilities and exploit code, uh, just things that they, sort of like uh, Tom Dixon, he said, what do you want me to blend next? Mm -hmm. And people would say glow sticks or paintballs, and he mm -hmm. would go get them and do it. Uh, we'll take customer requests and, and just, you know, do will it defend on, on anything. So you have a short demo that shows? Sure, uh, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. It's a. Uh, let me see. Everybody should listen to the music in their heads right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I, I was uh, slacking I, I, on the. I'm sorry. The I, I, uh, I I can't hear the music over the voices. <laughs> All right. So the um the theme <laughs> song. I gotta do the theme song. Oh yeah. yeah. Why, why not? More fun. Oh. That, so not only does Peter have the the custom lab coat, but you had so you licensed a theme song. For I this licensed whole a theme song. Yeah, that's I mean, right. I want to make it fun and entertaining. Uh, so the the theme song is, I think. The best. It's perfect. 80s game show. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <Wow>. I love it. <laughs> okay, so let's do this. Uh, what we're going to do is take advantage of that CVE. And if anybody wants to follow along at home, that is CVE 2012-5615. I was definitely wrong on that number. 5615. <laughs> so uh, what we have here is a Linux box. It's an application server. And it talks to a database server, a MySQL database server. So um, if you want to, uh, are we showing the laptop screen at this point? Oh, what do I need to do? All right. Let's see if that it works before the show. That's it's always when it usually works. okay. There you, you go. You got it. Okay. Cool. So we've got this. Uh, and yeah, I know that you're seeing a black screen uh, command prompt here. So we're on a Linux application server. There's a remote database server. I'm an attacker. I want to figure out what's interesting here. So we do a netstat. We see a remote connection to a remote MySQL. Uh, I want to figure out what version of that database. So what do I do? I could use Netcat, I could use Telnet, I could use anything that makes a TCP port. I'm just going to point it at the remote database port, uh, port 3306 for MySQL. What I get back is a handshake. That handshake negotiates the wire protocol that we should be using to communicate. Well, it also divulges the version of the remote database. Now, which is the firewall. Re really old. Which is really old. <laughs> yeah, there, there's no question. We're yeah. just going to go. Because it's a 2012 yeah, CVE. Exactly. Sure. So, um, so anyway, we, uh, we get this version information. Firewall saw it, and it said, yep, that looks like MySQL protocol. Come on through. What do we do with it? Of course, we go to Google. That's, that's what you would do. Right. Um, so I go to Google, and I say MySQL 5.5.10 O'Day remote code exploit. The fourth one in the list here is um, MySQL jackpot. Again, 2012, December 2nd. What we're going to do is download this code, and we're going to point it at the database server. Um, again, the firewall is going to see this and it's going to say, wow, that looks like MySQL protocol. Come on through because that's what the policy says. And I'm going to take a break here and just say there's two sections to this. You can see the uh, 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 reverse shell at the bottom where we use the net user command to change the administrator password. But above that, that's actually loading the DLL into the plugins directory, executing it using a user defined function call that initiates it and executes the code within the DLL, which makes the reverse shell connection back to us. So at this point, the firewall could not detect 
that there was this malicious payload, that it was using the CVE, it had no idea. And every single security profile is set to strict enforcement. We've got uh, deep packet inspection going. We're doing uh, you know, application protocol verification. Can't figure it out. But it does detect the reverse shell. But again, it was too late. I already changed the administrator mm -hmm. password. Uh, and you know, if I were really able to load a DLL, I wouldn't put a reverse <laughs> shell in. I would just change the password right, in the right, DLL. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, yeah, I got so uh, here's what we're going to do. Um, living off the LAN. This is a wrapper around uh, the MySQL admin command. Again, I just connect in, list the usernames and password, firewall sees it, says, ah, that looks like MySQL protocol. So let's enable protection on that database connection with Edgewise. And what we do here is we verify cryptographic fingerprints. So uh, hash values, fuzzy hash values, so on. Uh, on Windows, we can verify PE headers, signing certificates, and all of that. All we do is we click Approve. We're going to approve the user's microservice to talk to this MySQL database, and it's going to block all of these other things, the Telnet connection, the MySQL admin, and MySQL jackpot. We click Apply, and at the end of it, all we need to do is bounce those three things again, and we'll see, does Edgewise defend or not? Uh, so here we go. We try Telnet. Nope, permission denied, because it is not trusted legitimate software. We try MySQL exploit. Nope. Not allowed. Error 2003, permission denied. And we because try. Because you have a hook on that Linux exactly. system. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. We're able to do end-to-end -end verification mm -hmm. so that it's only the right software communicating. Mm -hmm. That user's microservice, no problem. It talks to the database, but nothing else can. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really the difference between a firewall and sort of this identity-based zero-trust approach with Edgewise. Anyway, thanks so for uh, entertaining me. Now that. I have to go <laughs> find a, a, w a web exploit for this application to try and execute SQL statements, yep. which makes it a little more difficult for a the attacker. More, a little more difficult. Right. Yep. And then you've got obviously got other... If that does happen, you've got other protections. Well, I like to think of the defensive technologies that I really like are, forcing, are, are making it really difficult for the attacker. Not impossible, right? But like at some point, you're going to step outside what the normal application does, what the normal user does. You make it pretty far, you know, pretty far down the path yep. before you're like, I just, I got to do something that's just outside the norm. And the tools that I'm seeing that I really like are really keying in on that behavior. W when we first, uh, this is like two years ago, we first got the underlying technology working for doing the end-to-end -end verification. Uh, one of the developers, he was prepping for a demo. He had enabled it. I didn't know that. I go onto the box. I'm trying to do something. I was banging my head against the wall. You and yourself. I was literally, I was about to rebuild the machine because nobody had told me mm -hmm. that this was working. It was on and that I had never even seen it function correctly. And somebody's flipped the switch and I was like, what the hell is going on here? It, to <laughs> an attacker, that was supposed to. <laughs> exactly. To an attacker, it is befuddling how a connection could exist from one software to another, and yet something right next to it can't make the same connection. And all I need is the, the mouse to do the one-click microsegmentation oh, uh, You need a mouse. You need, you need a mouse. You need a mouse. What if, yeah. I, what if my mouse like, isn't there? Spontaneously broken? combusted? Is, or, or what if my mouse ends up in a blender? It ends <laughs> accidentally falls <laughs> into <laughs> a blender. Oh. I'm making margaritas at work. Because that happens yeah. sometimes. Oh, I mean, certainly here <laughs> in the studio. Here in the studio. If someone just throws... <laughs> You're about to auto-segment, and... You accidentally drop your mouse into the blender. What you can would tell that we just have a glorified excuse to put a mouse in a blender on the show. <laughs> what would that even look like? I, you know, I, there might be a mouse in that drawer right there, Peter. Is, and there, is there? We, we, we could try. We could definitely try oh, that. Oh, man. Oh, so I got to gotta channel the Tom Dixon. That's right. Will hold it blend? On, switch the that is the question. Hang on one second. Let's make sure we've got the right, uh, right, camera. right Let, camera. Let's around. see if this thing is even plugged in. We have to, uh, if you push that button oh, in the on. front. Oh, yeah. oh, oh wow. Yeah. Put it all the way up. Crank it all the way up to the highest. Okay. I might need to use the pulse setting here. That's the, the button on the, the front of on, that on dial. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, this is perfect. Let's see. Yeah. What do we have here? We've got a, uh, a you know, Vera mouse. mouse. Perfect. Perfect. Let's do it. Hang hey, on one second. Mark, Mark, you got, Mark, the, you camera got set? the camera set up? Hold on. Okay. Can we switch, switching, switching to camera seven? There we go. Do, does this have a battery? Right, in we, it? Got, uh, we got we got mixer cam. It? Yeah, no, no, check check quick or not? Uh, f who cares? Oh, you know what? If so it does, let's not let's not breathe in any of the fumes. There How might be uh, explosives in there right. too. Just small. Let's explosives. let's replay that. Ready? The mouse is in the blender. There you go. Now let's see. If we were to, to 
pulse. Uh, this might, it's glass, so it might explode. I think, <laughs> I think uh, Blendtec blenders are like polycarbonate or something yeah, yeah, yeah. like that. They, they're not going to explode in my Go face. Go easy with so. the pulsing. Push the yeah. button. Okay, pulse here we go. Oh, oh my goodness. It's happening. It's, it's definitely shredding. Wow. Let's now, go to 11. Isn't that a... 11, yeah, that's a, that's a it setting. It goes all yeah, the way to 11. 11. Yeah. It goes to 11. Oh, that's my good. goodness. That sounds oh. better. Oh. It's a little more breaking up for the... Uh, you uh, should have bought a Blendtec blender. Oh no! <laughs> we destroyed like the blender and the, the mouse. Crap oh, sweater. the blender's done. The mouse is done Just too. For our audio the mouse wins. Uh, for those listening to the audio, uh, that wasn't an actual mouse. That was like a mouse you click with. Oh, yeah, 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 yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> no oh. animals were harmed in the filming of this segment. Oh, that's uh. perfect. Well, sorry about your blender and your mouse, uh, but. It happens. It's okay. But now we have no mouse. How can we do one-click segmentation? Oh, maybe you could use your phone. I'm I getting know. like flashbacks, like Ed Scotus's office. He was taunting me on Twitter because I'm tricking out my office, and his comment was, "Try harder." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So I am gonna send you. I'm gonna send you a Bluntech blender. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I destroyed your <laughs> your blender. Uh, I'll make sure you get one that wow. could never possibly be destroyed. Awesome. Thank Challenge you. Yep. Challenge accepted. Challenge <laughs> accepted. Mud slides for everyone the next time you're in studio. Oh. Perfect. Oh. Mud slides. You like mud? Oh hell yeah. I haven't I had just one. Just got though. one. I just got one question. Uh, how are you going to make the cocktails for the rest of tonight? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've got another crappy blender under there that we haven't run any uh, foreign objects through yet. So we'll see. All right. uh, <laughs> you're a well-prepared man, Paul. So much like Ed's office, there's other ways to control. Oh, the there is. So um, there's this uh, video online that I show uh, doing a auto segmentation process using uh, Siri. And uh, so that's what we do. Sometimes Siri will be a little finicky, but let me let me get this going. They're all a little finicky. I, I know. Like what? They're all. You know what? The Amazon one's really creepy lately. Really? I told it to set an alarm uh, for for the morning, and she goes, "Okay, I'll set an alarm." She's like, "It sounds like you're getting ready for bed. Do you want me to play relaxing music?" I'm like. No, that's creepy. Just like close the pod bay doors. Like I just like no. <laughs> hey, Edgewise Auto Segment Database Servers. Done auto segmenting database servers with zero clicks. Database servers are one hundred percent protected. You've eliminated fifty three network attack paths and protected ten application paths. That's like so nerdy, that's, Peter. I, that's I, I what like, it does. You're gonna have to come back more <laughs> often. Hey, <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, Ed Scotus. <laughs> Try harder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, the, the reason we did this is because everybody, every vendor, oh, one click or this, that, or mm. the other thing. But one click turns into 50 or 100. Yes, and it's yes. like, okay, sure. There was one click in there at some at point. At some time for the demo. Right? Yeah. So, so I wanted to make it clear that when you you see an ML object, we can't give ML objects their names. You have to give it a name. Mm -hmm. So I had name that ML object gotcha. database servers, yep. it comes up initially with some random value, but you name it database servers. And from that point, the one-click auto segmentation, I ask Siri to do it. And all that does is the one-click action and builds all the policy sets out with, of course, default block enabled. I don't actually expect administrators to ever do, do that <laughs> in sure, real life. Sure, <laughs> yeah. Unless you're at SCOTUS. <laughs> unless, unless you're at SCOTUS, yeah. sure. Well, as long as the follow-up command is, hey, Siri, could you send out my resume, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, if uh, if a uh, default blocking were enabled, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Peter, that was fantastic. Uh, I don't remember the last time we destroyed a piece of electronics on the show. It's been some time. So the one when Joff spilled beer in his laptop. Uh, that might have been that's, the last that's time. That's the one. It was the it was the ten year anniversary. We beat up laptops. Remember? Uh, I don't yep. know if we've ever blended anything like that on the show. Before. No, we've had you jump on them and fall on your ass, and we yep. shot stuff with potato, potato cannons, cannons, and uh, it's been we a long played time. Uh, laptop pinata. Yep. <laughs> and uh, we uh, we put that's holes the one I was thinking of. Oh, we put thermite. holes. In, we put holes in routers and thermite. That was all. Th thermite. No, you didn't. We did. We, we melted did. Thermite, thermite through electric. <laughs> Larry, yes. How about sledgematic? Yep. We've done yes. sledgehammers. We've, we've done axe. Yep. The axe. The best. I, I think. I think we're overdue for 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 oh, more. The one that we don't have on video that I've done is uh, shot hard drives with a thirty out six. Yeah, that's that's a thing too. How about this? 
I send you the Blendtec blender. You get a small. Take one of these routers off the wall. I was just saying, you know, blend we the to refresh blend it the electronics yes. on the wall. I was gonna say, we don't. What would we do with the old stuff? Yeah, there you go. You gotta put it we, in the blender. Got, we don't need to. Do we it. don't need to take it off the wall. I have boxes that shit at home. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, I could bring in uh, a few uh, choice objects the next time I come to the studio. That'd be awesome. Have at it. Like my jazz drive. <laughs> oh yes, we'll make it jazzy. We'll play jazz music while we blend the jazz drive. My, only if it's I'm DJ my, Jazzy Jeff. That's right. <laughs> my my hundred megabyte reel-to-reel tape for backups. Well, Peter, thank you Where so much. Where is that? Oh, it's my pleasure. Tape of mine. Yes, oh. we've all got a lot of old electronics that we now want to put in the blender. So, yes. well, there, there's a blend tech coming. So, uh, I I owe it no. to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, with that, we'll take a short break. Uh, oh yeah, the landing page. For Edgewise is securityweekly.com forward slash Edgewise. Make sure you go there. There's a whole series of videos. The new feature's been released. You can get a, a, a demo from uh, you know the sales team over at Edgewise. Make sure you go do that. It's been awesome to see the progression of the technology. Uh, so yeah, do that. Securityweekly.com forward slash Edgewise. Stay tuned. We've got another segment coming up next with Graphwell.